Welcome to Why Am I, a podcast where I have conversations with interesting people and try and trace a path to where they find themselves today. My guest for this go around is Adam Crack Winrich. He's a variety arts entertainer who specializes in cracking whips. I know, not something you hear every day. He's by far the most analytical and calculating person I've spoken to, which is something that has driven him to be the success he is today. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Adam. Uh, Adam Winrich, thank you so much for joining me on the Why Am I podcast. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. So um, I usually do this thing where I introduce uh, the guest and I previously I would kind of tell a little bit about you. Um, I don't think that's necessary in this case because I prefer my guests to uh, tell me about them. And I usually set it up like you and I are in line somewhere where are we in line at we're at the uh the the mars cheese factory or whatever it was and we are uh, waiting to pay our bill it's exceptionally long they're having problems with the credit card machine so you and i are having a conversation i tell you uh what i do for a living we talk about it for a second it's your turn to reciprocate so who are you adam well my i am a professional whip cracker i mostly do shows at renaissance festivals and uh, I've set a few Guinness World Records for whip cracking, and I've uh, been on TV a couple times. So when you meet a stranger and you drop that on them, what's the what's the general reaction? Oh, uh, they're like, oh, okay, All right. that's <laughs> cool. Is that that's on Fork Street? Um, I yeah, I guess when you say variety arts, um, I mean, I guess some people don't think uh, it could be sort of I don't know a viable form of a living, but no, being there, I think. Of all the industries you know, in the United States that still function well, I think the live festival scene still works well. And um, and also people like going to live events and experiencing them in person. And so that's and so the entertainment industry is still really strong. Um, I know like, uh, I also play harmonica. So kind of my first taste of trying to be in sort of the entertainment industry was like, trying to be in a blues band. Uh, in West Central Wisconsin, and there, people's idea of going out to bars to see bands has been going downhill since the 1970s, really. Um, but I think uh, with like Renaissance festivals uh, have just been in- improving since the 1970s. Um, so it was nice for me to be able to find an environment where um, where they could be uh, or find an environment to perform that's still going strong. Gotcha. So it sounds like you had the desire to perform before you really had a fully formed idea of what that performance was going to be, huh? Oh uh, yeah. Well, you could say since I'm uh, a middle child and I was born in July, so I, my sign is a cancer and I'm also a Midwesterner. So that it completes the trifecta of wanting to be a people pleaser. <laughs> so, um, so naturally I'd like want to make people happy and get some attention. So, um, I was wanted some attention. I just wasn't trying to figure out like, you know, how to get it and how to make money off of it. Um, so the, the whip cracking, or I would say with the, the harmonica, for some reason, um, the harmonica, and I started playing that as soon as I was good enough, like, I want to be on stage, like playing in front of people. With the whips, it wasn't quite that way. I just liked making them and wanted to do a little bit of whip cracking here and there. And it, it uh, really wasn't until a renaissance fair opened near my house uh, that some friends of mine said, oh, hey, we would know you do whip cracking. You should go ahead and do a show at the renaissance fair. And then I could see that, oh, this was going to go way better than like the blues gigs I've been trying to do playing the harmonica and bands. Um, and people at the renaissance fair said like, oh, if you like doing this, go to this next fair. And if you like this fair, go to the next one. So um, it took about four years and uh, for me to build up like a year round circuit where, where I stay as busy I want to be all year round. That's wild. So let's start at the start. How did you get into the, I mean, the whip cracking thing to begin with? Like what got your interest sparked in whips? Uh, Indiana Jones. Oh, which one? Uh, I saw the third one, uh, Indiana Jones and the last crusade in the theater yeah. in 1989. And then I thought, oh, I want a whip. I mean, around that time, I also saw other movies like, um, on the early nineties, um, the Kevin Costner, Robin Hood movie came out. And so I wanted to have a sword just like Morgan Freeman. So my dad gave me a grinder and a piece of steel. So here, go ahead and make a sword. And um, I also like made some of my first whips when I was a kid. 
and um, learn to make them. So I've saw stuff in movies and wanted to do it, and it's just the the whip thing kind of stuck around. That's interesting. That's not something uh, I, I would think most people would uh, jump straight into. So it sounds like you kind of came from this sort of DIY make stuff sort of background. Was that predicated from your dad? You think? Yeah, I think it was part of part of that. Um, also, I remember when I was like just first into whips. I must have been about ten or something. My um, we took a, a trip out west, and I'd like learned how to do a basic braid, and I had a basic real basic whip that I'd made myself, and I wanted to try to make a better one, or at least I wanted a better whip. And we were in Wall Drug. I was looking; they had whips for sale there, made by a guy named Chris King. And I think like, a bull whip was about one hundred and fifty dollars, and I had like one hundred and twenty some dollars uh, from like my birthday or something. And I wanted to buy one, and my mom was like, "No, you're not going to buy one of those. You're going to go home, go home, make your own, get you a book." So they bought me a book that Tandy Leather sold called uh, Whips and Whip Making. And then uh, I started out learning to make whips out of that. And um, yeah, I guess it's more, I mean, my dad did a bunch of little craft stuff uh, sort of through the Boy Scouts. So it wasn't uh, the idea of like making that foreign of an idea. And also, this is before the internet. So it's not like I could have gone onto eBay and be, oh, here's a whip for $20. Let me buy this one. Right. Um, it just wasn't that much information around about, all right about whips so how about harmonica where did like the musicality and all that stuff come from oh uh, with the harmonica um so my grandma actually played harmonica i know with with the whips i've gotten a lot of uh, on, um on some of my more popular videos by we learned that from his ancestors and it gets <laughs> under my skin a little bit and obviously i did not like most nerdy kids um yeah. that born in the 80s if you got into whips it was because of indiana jones end of story that's it it's not for any other reason and um you know, the harmonica that is actually is something that went back in my family so my grandma played and then she gave harmonicas to all her uh kids so my dad had one laying around and one day my sister found it started tooting on it and then then it really stuck um when i was about 15 huh. and uh sort of made that my main focus for like a num number of years and the whips kind of took a back seat to that so did you was that another thing that was kind of self-taught the harmonica stuff um yeah yeah mostly I've, i think i've had a couple lessons um to learn like different techniques that i couldn't figure out on my own um but i didn't have like a like sort of music teacher or anything mm. did you ever have the opportunity to actually um play with your grandma at all mm, no i don't think so i remember her playing um no, we didn't really play anything together because, like, mostly she played like solo type stuff. Um, you know, it's like whatever folk tunes and stuff she could play. So, no, we never really played together. Huh. That's cool. That's, um, it always fascinates me when I find people that um, are really self taught on a lot of the stuff they do. So, do you think, are you averse to seeing how other people do stuff or do you kind of want to figure it out on your own first and then look for additional resources? Usually, how do you approach that stuff? Oh, I would, uh, it really depends what it is. So, no, I do know, like, let's say with the whip cracking, I do know some people that are whip crackers are like, I'm going to do my own thing. And I'm my own guy. And this is my own trick. And I'm not going to learn this other guy's stuff because that's what he does. <laughs> and I got my own thing. And my philosophy is if I see some, if I see something that I want to be able to do, then however I can figure out how to do it, then I will work on doing it. So if it's something on the harmonica, if I can't figure it out by myself, then I'll contact someone to be like that I think knows how to do it. Be like, hey, can I pay for your time so you help me figure this out? Or same thing with the whip cracking. Um, and in some cases, you just have people that just don't want to help anybody. So you just got to rewatch the video over and over again, whatever trick they're doing, and try to figure it out. And then um, sometimes I yeah, get some tips. Uh, there's one trick in Australia, about an Australian whip cracker that I've been working on learning where there's only maybe a couple people in the world that do it and because it's not a broad thing like two-handed australian whip cracking and it's a really complicated move so kind of what i had to do to learn that one is i watched the video and i found a video of someone else doing it which helped a lot to see someone else's take on it so i think i saw two other people's versions of it and then figured it out as close as i could and then i sent a video to the original guy and he was like you're close not quite and then so he'd give me some tips and I work on it again. And then he finally videoed himself from three different angles doing it. And then I sent the video he sent me to a younger guy I know who's a really good whip cracker. And I was like, hey, what do you think's going on in this video that I'm missing? And then so he did his version of it. And then um, between getting the 
original guy to send me a video and then this younger kid like give me his take on it i was like, okay now i think i understand exactly what's going on in this trick and now i can uh, do it do it how it's supposed to be done so it's kind of a long long process um i definitely i'm not af- afraid about uh, asking for help if um i'd almost rather do that than struggle and try to figure out something on my own without asking for help and being stubborn man the internet's become such an amazing place hasn't it like the ability for us to like contact somebody and say, Hey, can you make a video of this thing? And they'll take a little bit of time and make that happen. That's crazy to me. Sure. Yeah. It's definitely, I think the, um, probably the internet's created a, a golden age for lots of stuff. Definitely. I feel like with both whip cracking and harmonica playing, probably most of with harmonica playing, there's so many brilliant harmonica players that then now that are now able to learn so much because of the internet, uh, but whip cracking too. And whip making has grown a lot because of the internet and the way people can share information. That's cool. Do you think it's common for some people to want to like hold their, their secrets close to their chest? Or do you think that's just a handful of people? Do you think most people are pretty good about sharing all that stuff? Um, I think it's a handful of people. I mean, definitely there's, there's a couple whip crackers that uh, are they're like secretive about what they want. Like some people really are what they they're secretive about what they have, what they've created because they know this this is my thing. This is what I this would make me makes me an individual, and so they hold on to it really tight. And then other people, um, some people with the stuff they do, they just don't like making tutorials or they don't like mm. having to explain their stuff to other people, so they don't make videos explaining stuff. And I guess for me, I posted several tutorials on my YouTube channel um, about whip cracking routines. So I, I really like the uh, an, going into a routine and analyzing what's going on here. And there's this thing here and you got to do this this way and breaking it down and explaining stuff. And, and some people don't. Um, and yeah, I suppose it depends on like what you're in some ways is how secure are you in yourself as an individual? If you kind of feel very insecure, then I think that makes you want to hold on to what you have because you don't want anyone to get past you. Uh, and then, uh, and that's kind of how it goes. I mean, there's different artists like that in different uh, genres. Like with the harmonica, for example, when it was super competitive, they, there was the 1950s blues scene in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So there's some of those harmonica players that got really good that didn't know, we appreciate how good they were and felt insecure. So they didn't want to show anybody anything because that would like cost them money. That would cost them their gigs. And I feel like now in the, like where I'm at, at Renaissance fairs, like I could show anybody anything. And it's like, I'm so established that people just want to come see me as an individual, do my tricks and my yeah. take on it. So I'm pretty secure in my income. Um, so I don't feel like I need to hold anything back because if I do, if I, if I don't hold it back, like people are going to come gunning for my job. Yeah. That kind well, of thing. So much so that you've even made like an instructional DVD, right? And put that out there to help people. Um, we did a couple, um, I would say more with the instructional DVD. I guess that was more a blatant cash grab. <laughs> or it was the the point was is that I think with the DVDs I did those a year, uh, almost ten years ago, more than ten years ago. As my my um, now father in law, uh, he when I met him, he had been making movies and doing DVD and CD production for other performers and Renaissance festivals, and he had always wanted to do a whip cracking instructional DVD. So he asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said sure. So when we were selling them, like it was a good uh, additional source of income uh, while doing Renaissance fairs, um, but we never did like the deep dive of stuff that I think I'd like I'd want to do that I'd be into. So uh, most of that kind of stuff just goes up on my YouTube channel. That's awesome. This well, I mean. For me, it doesn't seem like a cash grab, right? It's like, I would consider you an artist, right? I think you said, like, uh, you called yourself an artist of sort. Uh, at the beginning. What did you call it? Oh, well, variety, variety artist. Variety artist. Like a, I think that's what we call it. It's, it's different. I don't know what you really say. With the, doing Renaissance fairs, it's different than, like, circus. You have, like, can have serious circus artists that learn skills at a high level but never have to learn to talk to an audience. Mm. Uh, but a renaissance fair is very important that when you come up with your bits, um, you also have like patter to go with it, sort of like uh, more like street performers, that um, that kind of thing. So you keep the crowd engaged. Um, we're just, it's an advantage of renaissance fairs where it's a little bit more of a friendly environment. So we don't have to be like as harsh as uh, in our, how we treat the audience or in our lines as a uh, like real street performer would have to be. Um, so in some ways we're more like, I don't know, stand up comedians that do tricks, uh, 
but you still say there's there's kind of an art to it but i don't know if anyone would consider it like high art yeah yeah but i don't consider it a cash grab right it's you're trying to support yourself in what you're doing and you know yeah. the the thing that people always need is money right it's, you know thank yous right. don't pay your bills and feed you but i mean they're always welcome right, right. I, I, at least that's what i've seen sure. from most artists and the stuff i do too mm. it's like um it's a monetary uh, method of saying i appreciate what you do uh, which i think is always yeah. important for people because yeah it's uh, whatever we go to the renaissance festival the the people like we frequent you all the time but you see so many faces you're never going to recognize me out of the crowd but we always try and support like the people that we really like because yeah this is your job and i think a lot of you guys say this is my real job and you know sure yeah. i totally i totally get that also made me think of uh um it's related to renaissance fairs and being an artist um and the challenge of coming up with new material. This is something I was talking to people this weekend that I thought was interesting. So other Renaissance fairs have opened before this one. And uh, a friend of mine went to the Georgia Renaissance Fair. And he was kind of upset that even though the fair had been like closed down for a missed a whole season, that the entertainers hadn't written new material. He went and saw the shows. And like, it's all the same thing. They had all this time. Couldn't they come up with some new material? So that kind of stuck with me. So I thought it'd be fun. I was walking around asking people this last weekend here at the Bristol Renaissance Fair. Um, this is an informal public opinion poll on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being import, very important. How important is it to you to see new material in the shows? And people be like, oh, eight, eight, man. Yeah, totally. And someone said like, I don't know, seven. And then someone else said, I don't know, I'm just happy to be back. So I'd say like, oh yeah, that answer. Yeah, we like that answer. Uh, but a lot of people like new material was super uh, important. So, so I was trying to write yeah, new material um, for this uh this season because I had stuff that I had been working on uh, during the pandemic when I had time off. So I wanted to be able to introduce that uh, into my shows. Um, but then someone, uh, so this is the come back to is that then someone then in one of the shows turned the question back on me and said, well, and well, you as a variety artist here at the Renaissance Fair, looking at the fair as a whole, how important do you think it is that the entertainers here introduce new material? And my answer was, well, I'm not going to give it a number. All I'm going to say is, is if you're doing shows out here and you suck, then you need to keep writing new material. And then once you start find, once you find something that doesn't suck, then you keep doing it until <laughs> it starts sucking. And that was, and that was my my answer to them. And I like uh, it. let me thought. You know, oh, so, that's a pretty good answer. Yeah, I think so too. Something you you said a second ago was, um, you know, it's different than being like a street performer. Um, and I was thinking about that juxtaposition of where you guys are in the Renaissance Festival versus street performers. So street performers, generally, it's people that are on a mission, right? They're going to point A to point B, and, and you might be able to steal a little bit of their time. But some of those people see you as like an inconvenience or whatever, right? You're just, you're out there, you're in their way or whatever. Whereas the Renaissance Festival, that's like a target-rich environment, right? People are there with the assumption that they're going to be entertained by you guys. So I guess, I guess that does make it a lot friendlier. Yeah, I would say that's the big, big thing is that if you're doing street shows, like just out in the general public where people are just walking around, those people aren't showing up or walking by expecting to see a show. You're getting kind of a very cold audience. But yes, people that come to the Renaissance Fair are very warmed up, like, oh, we're here to see shows. We want to, see, we want to be entertained. So yeah, it's a very different environment. I guess uh, street performers see a lot fewer drunk people, though, huh? I don't know. I suppose it depends where you are. I mean, <laughs> if you're in places where, I mean, some places like Vegas, you can just walk around with uh, oh, yeah. on the street with drinking. I've seen street performers there on the strip. Yeah, for sure. If you if you had your uh, your drillers, would you ever try like just for fun, like to do a street performance? Is that something that your act would even translate to? Oh, I think it would. I mean, the one big advantage with the whips is that they make a lot of oh, noise, yeah. so it really draws in a lot of people um, easily. Uh, I guess um, the other thing is, I guess what I've found is that um, doing Renaissance fairs kind of totally satisfies my need to do shows with whips. So uh, every now and then I'll go do something else. Um, but as far as like, all right, I should go find some some other way to make money doing whip shows. And I'm like, no, I think I'm good with Renaissance fairs. It's totally sat satisfied my need. Anytime I've done more than like my four Renaissance fairs that I do a year, I always feel like, yeah, that was okay, but I didn't need to go do that. Gotcha. 
if that makes makes sense. How many how many of those do like, you hit on average a year? Um, pretty much the circuit that I have now is just uh, four Renaissance fairs. So I do one in Arizona, one in south of Dallas, the one I'm at now in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and then the Texas Renaissance Festival. North of Houston. So that pretty much fills out my year. I usually have time off in June and September. And um, so I have in, filled out both of those months before with the uh, working. And then I always feel like, no, nah, I'd rather have that time off. Yeah, because these things, it's not like one weekend or two weekends. Like the Texas Renaissance Festivals, that's like a couple of months, right? That's, yeah, pretty much all of them are a couple of months, about uh, eight weekends. Um, the one here in Kenosha is nine weekends. Wow. that's But that's still... I mean that's still a decent amount of travel. What do you where do you live when you go to these things? Uh, we have an RV, we have a fifth wheel trailer that we live in. Oh, man, so you're driving that thing all the way from because your home base, I guess, is Wisconsin, right? Yeah. All right, so you're driving all the well, way. Well, the the, the, the the circuit that we have is actually pretty s simple. So I have I have friends that do rodeos that have to go like crisscross the country, like. I don't know. Every year, like put it on thousands and thousands of miles. Uh, for me, it pretty much it goes uh, the start of the year in Arizona, and drive to Texas. It's about two days, and then drive to Wisconsin, back to Texas, back to Arizona, to Texas. It's it's just that little <laughs> L-shaped thing. So it's very simple. Um, and then so done the drives several times, so it's become pretty easy. So it's not like um, oh, I'm here in Kenosha for a weekend. Ooh, now I got to drive out to Seattle. That'd be a bit much for yeah, me. All those. Plus, you, I mean. You have a pretty good schedule of what you're going to do all the time. So you've got it. Laid right. Out. Yeah. That's it's nice. nice. Yeah. It's nice having a steady schedule, like from year to year, like, okay, I'm probably going to be here again and here again. I got not sweating. Like, where's the next gig going to come from? Do you make a lot of friends when you go to these places like other performers or vendors? Oh uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes some people I only see at like a one specific fair and other people I'll see from like at several fairs throughout the year. So yeah, totally. Um, a lot of my pretty much yeah the majority of all my friends are do renaissance fairs i also have like another group of friends that are kind of more just in the whip community that i might get to see like once a year maybe but then yeah a lot of the friends that i make through renaissance festivals this is whip community that's a, a phrase i never expected to hear there how big is the whip community when you say that oh it's not that big like sports, I don't know. It's hard to describe sports that are bigger than whip cracking would be like knife throwing or riding a unicycle. Like even unicycling, I started to learn to ride one last couple of years. Almost every major college has like a unicycle club, which I was unaware of. And definitely they don't have whip cracking clubs. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think it's weird with whips where there's a lot of people that will get the itch. Like, oh, I want to I want whip and I want to try that. And then they end up with something that's, I don't know, 20, 50 bucks that they crack a couple times and they break it and they, it gets thrown in the closet or something. Um, and then, the, yeah, it's hard to say how, how big it is. Um, usually the I do put on a whip cracking competition out in Los Angeles. And that uh, uh, we can get um, up to, I think, our biggest turnout was like 40 competitors, something like that. And then um, I think we had overall like viewing public was about a hundred people. Um, there are whip cracking events that uh, in sort of the German speaking area of Europe um, where I, I visited that uh, in Southern Germany in t January, 2020. And uh, some Italian people were telling me about competitions they have where there'd be like several hundred competitors that show up. Um, but that's just a whip cracking done as sort of a folk tradition in that part of the, the world. So it's a little bit more different and it's kind of simpler than what we're trying to do out in Los Angeles, where we're trying to do like fancy two-handed whip cracking like on, they do in Australia or whip juggling or whip tossing. And you, you said you started the whip competition or you're part of it? Uh, I started it mainly because uh, like, like I enjoy going to conventions um, that are related to either Western performing, like knife throwing, lasso spinning, gun spinning, or whip cracking. And there was kind of uh, when I started – doing whips full time there was a convention put on by a club called the wild west arts club and they folded in 2007 and they used to have a great convention they folded in 2007 and then another group tried to take over that called the uh, the let's see was it um wild west performance art society they were related to sas the single action shooting society and that only lasted a couple of years and then kind of once they were done like, like there really wasn't like a real big sort of western skills event or whip cracking event like in the united states at all and i had taken a trip out to los angeles where they have a pretty sizable 
um, group of whip crackers out there. There's a few people that are really talented. And so I went out there and then just me going out there and meeting them on one of their like monthly whip meetups, like we had 20 people show up and I was like, Oh, well that's totally enough people to like start a convention. So there did, there wasn't anything like it going on at the time. So I was like, Oh, let's just start a convention in LA middle of winter. It's a nice place to be. I got some time off. I got time to organize it. So, so I started that out there and then uh, I think our first year was 2015. And then we did, so the only year we missed was um, the 2021, like this January. So we did an uh, online video competition instead. And then there we had about uh, 70 to 80 video entries from around the world. That's cool. That's cool. So what is it about conventions that you like so much that you would actually start one up, you know, get one going? Uh, pretty much everyone that comes out that says, well, you know, it's like the whip cracking is okay, but we just like all the people that come out. Like it's just a... Uh, it's the one chance where like it's people you're acting interacting with online on a regular basis and then now you finally get like this few days to like hang out with them in person um so from the most important thing is just to go out and just hang out with our friends that's pretty much why all the old the other conventions were ever popular i mean people like it's sort of friends you can make through a common interest and I think that's a pretty uh, good, solid way to make friends. Like, when we have this shared interest, but it turns out, oh, we all both also like this other thing. That's cool. Right? So we'll be friends. So it's, uh, yeah, mostly the the people is why why people come out. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't really have like a lot of uh, friends, and especially that are anywhere near me. But uh, once a year, whenever I go to, well, I don't know, we go to several conferences. But whenever I go to a conference, a lot of times I'll see these guys that, uh, I mean, they're basically they've over the years have like become family or whatever we interact. Yeah. Like online and stuff. But, um, whenever we go to these conventions, I don't ever even do anything related to the convention. I just go and I hang out with people at this point. Sure. Like that's yeah. my only reason to go. It's so weird. But, um, I found that too, like a lot of those people will pick right back up where we left off. It's like no time has passed. It's so, so strange right. how that yeah. works for me. That's cool. So it's, it's about community. Right? You're just yeah. Building a community and you believe in it so much. You love it so much that you're, starting i can't even imagine like how big a pain in the butt it would be to like coordinate all that stuff and get everybody together and make all that happen oh i thought like it was just pretty simple um because other people have seen what i've done out in la and they're like oh i want to do one too or like oh i can't make it out to la so i'm going to put on my own and then i told them it's basically first um so you gotta like pick a date and then or yeah, find a park to do it in and schedule a day for that park and then tell everybody about it and then just figure out what competitions you're going to do and then get some prizes together and then people will show up. That's about all you got to do. And then some people just get boggled down in the like, oh, we're actually confirming a date. It's like they get boggled down in the first step. I was like, I think this is pretty easy. But I think mostly what helped is that the spot where I picked – um there was already, I want to say, a, uh, a critical mass of whip crackers out there. So even if nobody showed up from outside of the state of California or if only L.A. people showed up, we'd still have enough people to feel like, oh, this is a worthwhile event. So I think that was important. Other people have said, like, oh, could I do one like in Magnolia, Texas or something like either before or after the Renaissance Fair? And the hard part is there's, there's maybe a couple whip crackers I know in the area or whip makers, um, but there wouldn't be enough to make it feel like there's an event Um so I think that also helps. You kind of need to pick your spots and know, all right, there's enough people here that uh, we got the critical, critical mass to get things going. Mm. Do you think just attaching your name to this stuff kind of helps build the attention, builds the, builds the people? Sort of. I, I guess maybe. I don't know. I mean, I do a lot to, I would say, like posting stuff online so people are aware of who I am. But I know um, we have like so many other ta super talented people that come to our convention that uh, – I think I'd be a bit full of myself if I thought, oh, my name is the name that makes this happen. Like, I know it's like this whole group of people that are there that other people want to see. Uh, like, we've had a, a whip maker come over from Australia who's super talented and, like, tons of whip makers want to come just, just to talk to him. Um, so I think it's helped that uh, we've had so many people show up in the whip community that are draws in themselves. So people will come because, oh, I want, like, uh, this whip maker from Australia, I think we had people come all the way from Louisiana just because they wanted to out to LA because they wanted to meet him. Hmm. Well, do you, I mean, do you make whips still, right? Like I, I, at yeah. one point you actually made, you know, that was part of your living, right? And are you still kind of making a chunk of your income from making whips? 
Definitely when Renaissance fairs were closed or shut down, I was mm. like actively taking orders. And then for a while, like, yeah, whip making was really my only source of income. Come. So I was just mostly was trying to like pay the bills without having to like dip into my savings um, was the goal. And then um, I kept taking orders up through kind of the spring and then seemed like Renaissance fairs were starting to open up again. So I stopped taking orders just so I could finally finish out the rest of my orders and then just make whips when I felt like it instead of having more orders where people are like, hey, it's my first whip. I'm super excited to get it, man. When am I going to get it? They're like you placed your order yesterday. <laughs> and I have... 20 people ahead of you so um most I, I i taught my wife how to make whips and she's very good at it and runs a very good business so mostly now if anyone's like hey man can i get a whip and i was like here is my wife's website contact her she will give you a definite wait time and she's happy to do it that's cool but you don't because i've noticed you don't really you haven't mentioned that you are a whip maker you haven't really you haven't really spit that out so you don't really think of yourself as a whip maker oh uh, i i do uh, to a certain extent, but it's like, it's not the thing that's like, I want to keep pushing out there that I want people to think of me as I suppose mostly I would like people to think of me as like, Oh, it's just an entertaining whip cracker variety artist, uh, as opposed to a whip maker. I know sometimes it bugs me a little bit where it's like other performing friends of mine that I've made whips for. It feels to me like, what am I? Am I only good to you for the whips that I make? You don't like the material I'm putting out or my jokes <laughs> or stuff. I was like, um, I don't know. I mean, in one part, I guess I look at it as like with my level of interest. Like sometimes I'm more interested in whip making than other times, but um, it's not the big thing that I'm pumping out there. That's gotcha. it. We're trying to be known for. What I, I mean, on your, I mean, you're very active on social media, which is, which is awesome. And I like on your Instagram and stuff like that. I've seen some of the, some of the whips you make and it looks uh, maybe not for you or, you know, maybe once somebody has been doing it for a while, but it looks pretty complicated. It looks, honestly, it looks tedious as hell. Is, is that, I mean, do you still like really enjoy making those things? Uh, some of them are very tedious. Yeah. I, I said, some, I like, like doing pattern work and uh, looking at uh, like other whips I bought or pictures of whips online and try to figure out like, what's the pattern in the handle and try to work it out and braid it. Um, and then every now and then, yeah, I'm inspired to, want to do that and make something fancier i'm um, not all of them are super tedious uh so, some whips i can put together in like an hour or two uh, and that's pretty easy but then some of the fancier ones will take me like a week so i noticed like a like a theme through everything you're talking about it sounds like you are a really curious guy like you're always trying to like figure stuff out you see something going on like somebody's cracking a whip in a certain way and i was watching a, a recent youtube video where you bought a bunch of whips on ebay and you were yep trying them all out and then just seeing kind of how they were made, you know, the, the pluses and minuses. Is that like uh, just the way your brain works? Like you're always having to figure things out, challenge yourself in new ways. Um, I suppose a major part of my personality is that I am both uh, a good study. Or I'm studious and analytical. Hmm. So those are big, big parts of my personality. And, um, I'm curious, I, I suppose, I wouldn't sound, I mean, um, there's tons of creative people out at the Renaissance Fair, so I don't, wouldn't say I'm always like the most curious one, but I mean, certainly if, if something piques my interest and I'm like, oh, that's cool, then I'm going to like see how far I can dive down in it before I like get museum brain or lose interest or feel like I'm over my head. Uh, with the Chinese whip thing, I guess, what was it? Uh, one curious question was like people want to know, well, where can I buy a whip, man? There's so many people buy whips on Amazon. And most of them are like made in Pakistan and they're only made to look like a whip, but they don't aren't actually made to function very well or last very long, which is kind of a bummer. So I was scrolling through Amazon to see like just what's on sale here, if there's anything I could recommend. And I found a whip made in China that was sold as a sport whip cracking whip. And they had pictures of people in China like actively using whips. So I thought, oh, this looks interesting. It was like 140 bucks. So I bought one. And then when I got it, I was very impressed. And so then I was like, oh, I wonder what other whips are made in China that are for sport use. That'd be neat. So I put together, yeah, the collection, about six whips. Let's see, was it like a rope, rubber, rawhide, cowhide, uh, cable, and then steel chain. And then the steel chain whip, actually, that's the, the best one that I bought or the most different. And then I'm using that. I started using it in my shows this past weekend because it like weighs five pounds and it's super loud and looks really uh, badass. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty um, intimidating. I guess would be the word. It, yeah, it is. Yeah, I just take it out. And I was like, Ooh, and I crack it. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, like, I'm scared too. 
it's, it's a scary whip. I mean, it looked intimidating, but to me, like, I guess the steel cable one seemed the most um, uh, dangerous. Is that the right? That's not the right word. It just seems like you could hurt oh. yourself more using the steel cable one than you could the other ones. I would say so. I probably mentioned that in the video that like, a lot of times when I've hurt myself with whips, um, I don't always like hit myself the cracker, but sometimes it's like the body of the whip will brush me somewhere. And if the body of the whip is very abrasive, that'll take some skin off. So definitely the way the steel cable whip is made, uh, it's got a lot of texture to it and a steel cable. So if you were to whack someone with that, like, yeah, it would like rip skin off pretty easy because of the rough texture of the braid. So, uh, I mean, most of the difference in the video that you would have seen the steel cable whip versus the other whips is that the steel cable whip was so short and light compared to everything else. So it just looks a lot faster. Um, everything else is a closer to the same kind of length and ballpark about the same weight. They're all like eight feet or longer, whereas the steel cable whip, I think, is only about six feet. Mm, that's interesting. So you said that you introduced your chain whip just recently, and you're so you are ever evolving, always changing stuff. So I guess you really did take that to heart. Um, the idea of, of bringing oh. a new material. Oh, n well, y yeah. What are those two things new that I was doing this year at this fair. So I did learn to ju try to juggle three whips, uh, last winter and I was working on that and I wanted to put it in my show at the last Renaissance fair I was at, but the ceiling there has a roof on it and I didn't have enough headroom to try to juggle the whips. Uh -huh. So I was focused on the unicycle there. And now that I'm here, I have plenty of like height to juggle the whips. I'm like, okay, now I want to focus on this and see what it takes. Like I know what it takes to learn to like get a few tosses when I'm by myself and I just turn on my camera and like how long it takes me to get like six tosses or eight tosses and catches but now i like, now what is it going to take for training and focus and like visualization to make it so i can actually juggle them in a, and have people be impressed in a show it's a whole different ball of wax Do you have to always be challenging yourself with something or like are you perpetually working on something uh i guess i mean i don't know i'm always kind of goal oriented i would say uh i don't know Usually I'll, I'll have something like, okay, well, this would be the thing to work on or let's work on this thing now and then that'll sort of run its course. Because I am dev definitely a, a practicer where I like have some having some kind of skill that I'm trying to work on every time I go out to practice. Like I enjoy practicing every day. It's just part of just who I am. Uh, so, I mean, when I, before I started, I didn't realize that about myself that I like started playing the harmonica and then like then the harmonica for a long time. I'm like, I'm going to put in my hour every day of uh, playing the harmonica for like 10 years. And then kind of once I got back into the whips and the whip thing took that over. So now it's mostly the whip stuff. It's going to be like, I'm not doing shows. Wow. Is that kind of meditative for you? Just where you zone out and focus on practicing stuff? Oh, I would say I never, I'm never really zone out. I suppose that's something I could add to my practice. Like to put on some music, man, and go with the <laughs> flow. And I'm, and I'm like, that's not really who I am, the person. I'm like, no, I want to do this, and I think it should go this way. And if I want it to go this way, I need to keep working on this, and I'm going to keep doing this for two months every time I go out to practice till I feel like getting any better at it. And then I'll uh, move on to something else, and then maybe I'll come back to it in a couple months. Wow. So it's dedication and focus and making sure you always show up to do the work, huh? Uh, yeah, I would be an interesting uh, or an anecdote about that is – um. There's a really talented whipcracker out in Los Angeles named Todd Rex. And he, his specialty, as you would say, is like whip tossing. He comes up, he's, he's cracking two whips, and he comes up with all these interesting ways to toss them around and behind his back and stuff. And that's what he really works on. And when he first met me, he asked, what does it take to get like really good at whip cracking? And I said, at that point, I'd done probably an hour a day for about five years. So then he was like, all right, I'm going to do an hour a day. And then I asked him years later about it. Like what his routine was like. And sometimes I go out to the park, but sometimes I don't want to go out to the park. So I do my hour every day, but like I'm just like in bed, like I just got a little whip and I just go pop, pop, pop. Or maybe like I'm on the computer doing something and I'm just holding it. And I was like, no, I maybe you didn't understand me. I went out for an hour a day with specific goals of things I was going to work on each time. I didn't just go out and just like randomly pop a whip for an hour a day. And, um, and I told him that. And I don't think. I'm not sure that really sunk in. I mean, he's certainly talented enough as it is. I wouldn't uh, blame him for just like just farting around with some little whip in his apartment to make up his <laughs> hour. Um, but yeah, this, different people have a different take on it. Gotcha.
So it sounds like you have a very focused personality. You kind of always had that. I, I yeah, I guess so. I always felt more comfortable with uh, focused activity as opposed to like unfocused activity. Say like, or oh, go to a party with a bunch of strangers and then like have some kind of just general fun interaction that's not very specific or focused. And I'd be like, oh, that sounds terrible. And we have like. <laughs> some game we're supposed to play or is there a pool table and I just focus on that or some, I don't know. Um, gotcha. So spontaneity is not necessarily like your favorite thing. Like doing improv comedy maybe is not like your uh, most favorite thing to attempt. Well, see, that's different. That's a different kind of focused activity and it's maybe a game I don't do a lot, but that would be a very focused activity that um, I've taken some improv classes and there'd be certain uh, moments that allow for like spontaneity in my show or like certain ways the audience goes and like then all right I have to be prepared uh, to say something in the moment like um, oh what did I say this is a little bit extreme um, in my shows last weekend I have a bit where I'll um, I'll bring a kid out from the audience um, and eventually what I'm going to want them to do is to uh, I'll put a bottle on my head and I want them to swing the whip and knock it off as opposed to like me having using the whip to have whipping something someone else is holding, I want to give them the whip and then they do it to me. And so to make sure a kid, when I pick them, to make sure that they're like just, just physical enough and will do something, I'll be like, all right, we're going to do a quick youth check and I have them do like the floss. Like I can't really show up here. And I'll have them do that. And if the kid won't do it, um, then I send them back. So a uh, kid, kid girl came out and then she I raised her hand. I want to volunteer. And she came out and she didn't want to even try the floss or any kind of dancing. Like, oh, you can go sit down. And then some other kid across the circle had on a Fortnite shirt. And then, all right, kid, you come out here. And I said, I swear to God, if you can't do the dance, I'm ripping that shirt off of you. <laughs> so that would be a moment of like, all right, there's, <clears throat> I mean, that's the, the fun of live entertainment or Renaissance yeah. fair. It's like the audience is there with you. You can see them all. And then, and they enjoy that kind of like interaction where they know that like, right, this particular moment, some of this stuff happens the same way, uh, show after show and other stuff is going to be like, oh, it's only this show is how this thing is happening. So we're all living one special, unique moment. And that's, I, that's the part I really love about that stuff is the spontaneity, the little spontaneous moments that you guys can interject. I mean, not everybody does it. Like you said, some people just go through the, the motions, but I, I love it when somebody, um, does that because... It's that moment where you hold your breath. You don't know which direction it's going to go. It's uh, it's usually a lot of fun to see how you guys pivot. Yeah. That's really cool. So I, I know we've gone way off on a tangent, but I was curious um, about uh, whenever you first got started, you just decided you were going to do this Renaissance Festival. So it's like, oh, I'm going to try and go Quack Rips. Like how much time did you have to prepare for that? Well, I would say... Um... I'd been whip cracking off and on uh, since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And then I had a couple of instructional D uh, videos, like VHS tapes as a kid. And then the harmonic thing kind of took off. And then I want to say I'd, I started making whips again, like in college for spending money kind of towards the end. So I went to a couple of events and I got a DVD from Australia um, about their 1999 Australian National Championships. And that was the first time I was, I was really fascinated with people doing two whip cracking mm -hmm. stuff. So that's kind of before the end of the college when I like really wanted to get into that and I started focusing on it. And that would have been about like 2003, 2004, somewhere in there. So I didn't do my first Renaissance Fair, to, but I would become fascinated with Australian competition. Um, so I've been working on that. And so by the time my Renaissance Fair started, I was pretty good with two whips. And that was something that hadn't been done, hadn't been done a lot of in the Renaissance Fair scene. So the people that saw me doing it said, oh, you're doing something that's not out there already. And so you would be easy for you to like go work at other Renaissance Fairs doing what you're doing. Um, so it wasn't like it wasn't like all of a sudden I woke up and like, I'm going to go crack whips at Renaissance Fair. Uh, it was sort of like I had been doing it. And then, but also I was making money. My only sources of income were like making whips and then a little bit of entertainment Monica. And then I didn't have a performance outlet that was that great for the two ended whip cracking until the Renaissance Fair started. And then I realized, okay, but both, I'm going to be cracking whips anyway, practicing it. And then the money at the Renaissance Fairs is way better than either making whips or playing the harmonica. So it was naturally something I was going to pursue more than those other things I had been doing. So you already pretty dedicated to whips and the art of like whip making and all that stuff because i mean that was one of your primary sources of income at the time so you'd already kind of committed yeah. yourself to this huh 
Yeah, well, I suppose with the the whip thing, like committing to that, like I went to school for math and physics, and then I took five years to get sort of my double major degree because after four years, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So I thought maybe if I just stick around for a fifth year and complete the physics major, then I'll know what I want to do. And then over that summer, I started selling whips on eBay, and I went to Wyoming and took a whip making class with a guy to improve my whip making skills. And then I started selling whips on eBay some more all throughout that that winter, that next school year. And then by the time that school year was done, I was like, okay, I think I'm just going to try to make whips now uh, as a living. Because like, I don't know what they always say. Like, I, I just don't think it matters when you graduate college. The job market is always bad. <laughs> and the deal is a math and physics major. It sounds like well, you should be able to do something with that. But it's just a general education degree. It's not like I'm specifically cut out for a specific job. Say like with mathematics, you can pursue that and take like actuary exam and become an actuary. And then you're working for like insurance companies, like calculating like risk and stuff like that. That leads you right to a specific job. But um, a math and physics major is doesn't lead you to a specific job. It's like every job and no job. So I didn't have a specific career path in mind, but I was I think I can make whips and make some money. Mm. So math and physics from everything you've told me that actually sounds, uh, that sounds like a good fit, like your ability to focus and practice stuff like repetitively for years on end. That seems like uh, something a math major would want to do. I suppose, I think with math, it's just more patterns, like just enjoying patterns or discovering patterns for me. I think, uh, honestly, I got good grades pretty much in most any of the classes I took, but the only thing where my grades were like slightly lower was, uh, maybe like anything that was based on like, uh, my, my English classes or something or like essays, like there, instead of getting like an A, I'm like an A minus. So I think I could have picked like almost any major and, and made it work, um, it was the only thing is like not everybody gets good grades in math and physics. Some people think, oh, I hate this. And I was like, oh, well, if you like it at all or you're all sort of good at it, you should pursue that. Hmm. I mean, at one point I told my parents, oh, I wish I could just switch my major to music and study music. And they were like, no, we, we think you can get a job with a math <laughs> and physics degree. You cannot get a job with a music degree. So that, or you can, you become, you become a music educator. That's the only reason uh, anyone would get a music degree is because you're going to teach music. Gotcha. So that's, that's kind of what I was hinting at. Well, there's something I was sort of hinting at when I was asking you about, um, you know, how you, how much time did you have for your first Rin Fest? Cause I was trying to figure out, it's like, where do you get the courage to go up on stage and do something that you've never like professionally done before, but you had already kind of been introduced to that with the harmonica stuff, right? So you'd already been performing yeah, yeah. for people. So can you kind of remember the first time you decided you were going to perform for folks like in any way, like that, that's what I I'm always curious about when I see people that are performers, like true performers like yourself. It's like, how do you get the courage that very first time to go and do it? Like, where does that come oh, from? Oh, I don't think it even takes any courage. It's a strong desire. Like this is what I want to do That's where I want to be. And then you figure out how to get there. It's not like, well, I'm scared to go. It's like, no, I want to go. And I think that was my feeling, at least definitely playing the harmonica. It was like I couldn't get to an open mic soon enough once I thought I could play a little bit of blues. Oh, wow. So yeah. what is it about that that feeds you? Is it just performing? Is it doing a good job like in the moment, like in, in performing this, well, this well, thing like you I practice? I think it's what, like I said before about being like a middle child and then being a cancer and a Midwesterner, um, there's some things with some people, not everybody has this. It's, some people have a nature of like, oh, I, I want to be in front of a group of people. I have approval of strangers. I want to like learn a skill and get applause from it. You want that kind of feedback. And some people really need that. Not everybody does. And some people really do. And then usually the better entertainers are the one that need, need it the most. And they work the hardest to get that. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Um, that you say that because you also said going to a party and not knowing anybody is not necessarily your idea of a, a fun time, right? Like to, to go and mingle. Right. Well, I heard about this with, um, I think I was watching some biography about Johnny Carson where it's like, it's not like Johnny Carson didn't like people. It's just, he liked it when he was in a focus setting where they kind of, he was the one in control and make things happen be in front of people and not be in sort of some, or a sort of random type situation, like your yeah. real party type situation. So hence, that's why you have a Johnny Carson show. We're like, oh, here's a fun, good time. We're around people. But it's like, I'm more in control and I focus. And then, um, yeah, sort of combine the control with a, a focus setting. So that way it's uh, not awkward for him. 
Right. Not everything is a variable. Some stuff is a, right. a known quantity. Yeah, that makes right. sense. That makes sense to me. So you get to your first Ren Fair and you're... I mean, did you did you have immediate success? I mean, obviously, you didn't walk in there with a patter, with uh, with a shtick or anything like that. So were you just kind of flying by the seat of your pants right off the bat? How did you figure all that stuff out? Um, uh, yeah, I suppose flying by the seat of my pants. In part, with some of the material, I think um, I had seen some presentations from Australia or like people explaining, here's how routines go. So I had some of that. Um I had seen like other performances on VHS tape. Like I had this video called the art of the bull whip. And so I sort of had like a little bit of an idea of like what tricks I could do in front of people that people definitely my first show was really rough. So the people like this, the other performers like the skills that I was doing. So I had people sort of help me along the way, like giving me some advice, like um, the first Renaissance fair I did. Um, so one performer took me aside and said, all right, a general good format is the B C A format where you figure out what your good tricks are and you basically do your B trick first, then your C trick in the middle and then finish with your A trick. So it'd be like sort of a two, number three, a number one trick at the end, that kind of organization. And it's, but it's a really long process trying to come up with my show at a Renaissance fair. I think the biggest things is that, I mean, I did enjoy telling jokes. I was to go before I came to the Renaissance fair. I like the idea of being in front of people and doing tricks and telling jokes. So I have to I want to get better. Um, but yeah, it was kind of a long process. Uh, eventually I did hire a director for my show who kind of told me like, all right, here's some other elements you kind of need in your show, like transitions or little like, bubbles of energy to get you from one thing to the next. So you can kind of make it flow better. And um, so it's not just like one dude, like occasionally a joke, now I'll crack whip as hard as I can, or now some other joke doesn't quite fit. So they sort of helped me uh, figure out how to piece things together. And then also really what helps putting shows together is you just, oops, call failed. I think you're still there, aren't you? Ooh. Yeah, I can yeah. still hear you. Uh, yeah, you're still going. Oh, okay. um, so also what helps is just being able to do the shows over and over again. And like, it's a new crowd, like do it over again, try something new, try something new. I remember one fair I was at, I had a little notebook and I think I always had something new to try every weekend. And it sort of goes back to what I said about uh, like new material at Renaissance fairs. It's like, uh, well, if you're sucking, like, do something new until you stop sucking. And definitely I was in that boat where I was like trying to figure out what works and trying new stuff. Until then, once you figure out what works, then you're like less likely to want to come up with new materials because I know this other stuff works so well. Coming up with new materials is going to be more painful. Um, How do you know when you're not sucking? Well, I think that's developed over the years of like, I was saying about this the other day, about being in front of an audience is that there's certain points where like like you get a feel for the energy you're getting back from the audience and you feel at that level and then all of a sudden boom, boom, you hit some at a different level. Oh, that hit that somehow hit the audience different. I got, got distinct different feedback. And you're like, all right, all right, things could be better this way. All right, so now I gotta figure out why was that better? How'd that work better? And then so eventually it's sort of like you just try to raise the level of everything. You write some new stuff that's better and then maybe have some older stuff that was sort of working but not quite as good. And now you know you need to write this stuff to bring it to the level of your other stuff that you have. So I think, yeah, it's just a feeling of being in front of back as possible. And you also have to balance that with like how busy the day it is, how hot is it, how tired is the audience, as opposed to like what kind of energy you get back. But uh, oh, with experience, you get the... Uh, an understanding of like, all right, here's how good things could be. And, and as you try to like make them that level every time as best you can. Hmm. Yeah. So speaking of making modifications to your routine, I know, I think it was the last one or the last two you actually introduced. I'm not sure if she was your wife at that point, but girlfriend, or I guess your, your new partner. So you actually added uh, like a little bit of knife throwing into your routine. How how was that for you to kind of shift and share the spotlight? Is that pretty simple? Oh, uh, well, that was my wife, Dakota, um, uh, and it shows that she, she only does uh, knife throwing with me at the Texas Renaissance Festival. Oh, okay. And just because of, there's so many people there, um, I did it by myself. The first time my show started out great and then it was going downhill. So I could tell her, right, I need to add it's sort of that feeling of sucking. Like you start up here and like now I'm sucking hard. <laughs> I need to change things around. I need to turn this around. So I'd been into knife throwing a long time. My dad was had knives and 
throwing knives and tomahawks around to a little kid. And Dakota's got the same thing. Her dad had throwing knives around. So we both had experience with it. And I decided I wanted to add knife throwing to the show, thinking I'd be the knife thrower. Um, but we were both practicing the month before the first time we did the, the Renaissance Fair. And we'd been come up with some new material. But we figured what we'll do is we'll just present it in front of an audience. And the audience will let you know what they like and what they don't like. And we very quickly figured out that the audience does not like it when I throw knives. They only want to see her throw knives, and which uh, make, makes a lot of sense. So we figured that out through trial and error very quickly, probably by like the second or third weekend that we had done it. And and then and that the routine that works and that every now and try to change something up a, a little bit. Uh, but the, the knife throwing routine we have going right now is pretty solid. Yeah. So how long have you guys been traveling together? I mean, we've been traveling together ever since about... 2000 i guess pretty much together really easily since i bought that trailer that we live in we bought it in 2014 um so really so long we've time been then. living together in the trailer since then yeah all right do you think life um, got easier yeah, we'd try- once you had a partner with you life get easier well definitely less lonely i would say i mean all i would say easier because dakota's here folding all of our laundry actually right now she went to <laughs> Um, no, I think it's just, I mean, compared to what the existence I used to have, like say at this Renaissance fair in particular in Kenosha of like, like living in a shack during the week, with no air conditioning and like a couple of friends around, but I'm just like in my shack at night alone. Um, and now we have like a trailer that's essentially our home that we live in, um, with my wife. So the evenings are like, oh, we can cuddle and watch a movie or something. So I would say it's a big improvement. That's cool. That's cool. Does she, um, does she balance you out? Because it sounds like you're a very focused person, you know, that likes to, uh, I, I, and this is me guessing, right? This is me projecting. You probably like to focus on a problem and work it to completion, right? Is, is she kind of the yin to that yang? Mm, no, I, I, I would say if I, the biggest thing is that, um, like, I like being funny, but sometimes I would say what I think is funny or some things I find, like, amusing, um, particularly when I was younger, don't generally translate to a bigger crowd or a better crowd. However, Dakota's been doing Renaissance fairs her whole life, and her dad also does Renaissance fairs. So oh, she okay. grew up knowing, like, all right, this is how a show's supposed to go. Here's what's funny. And she also just has a really good instinct uh, for, for, for what's funny. So I think I was telling her the other day is, like, my... I think just spending all this time around her and being around her has generally raised my idea of, right, this is the standard for comedy that you have to have if you're going to present stuff in front of an audience. And that sort of uh, rubbed off on me, even at the point now where, like, I might have some dumb idea in my head. Like, I think this is funny, but I'm well aware now what the standard is supposed to be, so I know what this is. This is just a dumb, weird, um, juvenile idea that I have. It's not really going to translate to uh, being funny to a group of people. So would you say, as far as, like, performances go, she's your biggest... uh fan or critic or maybe somewhere in the middle oh i would say um she's she's my biggest constructive critic there you go i hey. would think but it's important it's important to have that you need somebody who keeps you grounded and tell you like to let you know like what's up from down because sometimes yeah if you are hyper focused on something you only have one perspective on it and sometimes you really do need someone else's perspective on it to be like eh, it's kind of going like this yeah i'm definitely the kind of person that i want friends that tell me i've got a booger on my face you know, it might be inconvenient. It might be uncomfortable, but I need somebody to tell me I'm messing up. Oh yeah. If I, if I'm eating, I have food on my face. Dakota will be the first one to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I tell you what, man, I, um, I want to be very respectful of your time. I've gotten way more out of you than, uh, I had ever hoped for. So I really appreciate that. I want to close with one last question is that, uh, um, sure. Do you ever get nervous anymore when you're doing this stuff? Do you ever feel butterflies mm. or anything like that? Only, I think only when I've done like one-off gigs that are like TV or something, then I'll feel nervous. Like I was definitely nervous. I did Conan O'Brien a show in 2012. Very nervous doing that. Um, whenever I did the Gong show, I was super nervous doing that. And then uh, later I got to do a show called Das Super Talent. So I remember the, I was in Germany, and so I really had to learn, like, like doing a Renaissance Fair show. Like, I practiced during the week, and now I know exactly what I have to do to go out and do a show and do a good job. And a lot of it's just about being relaxed and being ready to have a good time. But then the TV show stuff, it's like you don't have, like, all the practice time you need right before it. So I had to really learn 
like, all right, if I need to do this, this day and this, this day and get this much sleep and it to be ready to go and like spend this much time meditating and relaxing. So I'm not like, um, all thumbs when I get out there. So definitely the, the TV gigs, uh, make me nervous, but the Renaissance fair is not so much. All right. Rock and roll, man. That's cool. And do you think that's just through preparation? Like you're just prepared. It's what it sounds like to me. You, if you're prepared enough, the nervousness shouldn't really be a factor. Oh yeah. Hopefully. I guess mostly I remember with the gong show, I think I was definitely underprepared for that because I knew what I was doing was a standard bit I've done several times at Renaissance fairs, where if I'm doing it at a Renaissance fair, I don't really need to warm up out there. If they do this thing or I can do this other thing, and then once I got out there, I could feel my level of nervousness. And I was like, all right, I'm going to have to do the very bare bones version of this routine without any extra fills because I feel like that's all I'm going to be able to pull off and, and be solid. Um so having that experience, I realized, that, okay, if I do want to pull off like a little bit of extra stuff, I have to put in so much extra rehearsal, like videoing myself and rewatching the video uh, um, to be able to pull it off when I, I go out there. All right, awesome, man. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time and your energy and everything that you, you put out there for folks. My that... high energy level on a Monday morning. <laughs> You're doing great, brother, after a long weekend, I'm sure. Um if uh, you want folks to be able to interact with you in some form or fashion, what's your preferred method for people to get a hold of you? Oh, uh, let's see. my website's firewhipguy.com or I'll win rich whips. Also goes to that same address. So it's an email on there. Yeah, I always respond to emails. Otherwise, I'm on uh, the Facebook fan page called Adam Crack Win Rich. And then I have uh, Instagram, which is uh, Win Rich Adam. And my TikTok is uh, Win Rich Adam. Uh, one of my TikToks got like 50 million views. So the most recent one has like a thousand views. So I'm not sure what views mean on TikTok. But if people want to see like a like a bunch of stuff I've created and videos, everything I'm up to, you can follow me on TikTok. All right. That's awesome, man. Well, um, thank you again for your time and energy and effort and uh, taking a chance on a stranger on the internet. So thank you. And uh, sure, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I hope to see you probably in October, man, when you hit the Texas okay. Rent Fest. All right. Cool. See you there. Let me click stop on this.